On July 2, 1863, the 20th Maine Infantry, under control of Colonel Joshua L. Chamberlain, attacked the Confederate troops in one of the most surprising charges of the Civil War. The 20th Maine was a volunteer regiment made up of men who did not fit into any other Maine regiments. By the start of Gettysburg, there were only 266 men left. Its numbers increased to 386 when 120 soldiers from the 2nd Maine were moved after the depletion of their regiment. At first, it was difficult for Chamberlain to control his new troops because they wanted to retire with the rest of their regiment. However, after a personalized letter from the governor of Maine and the positioning of skilled 2nd Maine men with the inexperienced 20th Maine men, things were looking up for this small band of soldiers. Brigadier General John Geary held troops on Little Round Top the morning of the fight on July 2nd. Geary was ordered to move his troops to Culp's Hill while Sickles' 3rd Corps replaced them. However, miscommunication caused Geary to leave too early, exposing Little Round Top for the first time that day. Luckily, Sickles' men made it to Little Round Top without any complication. But after making it to the small hill, Sickles continued to move his men west to Emmitsburg Road, leaving the hill once again unprotected. Colonel Strong Vincent was soon alerted by Bridget General Warren that Little Round Top was unmanned. Upon hearing the news, Vincent decided to send his troops, the 3rd Brigade of Charles Griffin's 1st Division of the 5th Corps, to defend Little Round Top. The brigade consisted of the 20th Maine, 44th New York, 16th Michigan, and 83rd Pennsylvania. Chamberlain and his regiment soon found themselves face to face with one of the most significant battles of the Civil War, the Battle of Gettysburg. Gettysburg was known to turn the tide of the war to the Union side. Little did the 20th Maine know that they were going to play a vital role in this major event. Chamberlain's men, unaware of the fight that lay before them, were positioned on the extreme left flank of the Union line, on the eastern side of the hill. Control of the 650-foot-tall Little Round Top was paramount to the success of either side during the battle due to the fact that it was clearer than Big Round Top and strategically placed along the Union line. For the Union, it kept Confederates from advancing. For the Confederates, it was the key to destroying the Union troops. With the entirety of the 20th Maine spread out on the left flank, its Company B was sent out front to act as skirmishers. Company B was made up of 44 men and was led by Captain Walter Morrill. They were joined by 14 sharpshooters and were tasked with harassing the oncoming Confederate soldiers. On this particular day, the 20th Maine was fighting Confederate troops from the 15th and 47th Alabama, a total of 644 men who were all led by Colonel William Oates. The regiments walked over 20 miles to get to Little Round Top. Part of this trek included climbing up and over the boulder strewn Big Round Top. This meant that Oates' men were already drained of all their energy by the time they got to Little Round Top. After news of a left extension by the Confederate troops, Chamberlain ordered a right angle formation of his men, creating the left and right wings of the 20th Maine. Captain Ellis Spear was put in charge of the entire left wing. This right angle formation allowed the regiment to extend farther east. During this time, the center of the 20th Maine began to break and give ground. Under heavy fire, many of the soldiers began to panic. If not for 25-year-old colored sergeant Andrew Tozer, who was originally from the 2nd Maine, the Confederate troops may have broken through. Tozer, however, stood his ground and encouraged many other soldiers to do so as well. As a result, they successfully made up the land they had lost. As the battle raged on, the soldiers of the 20th Maine started to run out of ammunition. Seeing no other option, Chamberlain ordered his soldiers to fix bayonets. After the command to charge was given, there was a pause. No one moved. Then, out of nowhere, Lieutenant Melcher sprung forward with his sword in hand. Soon enough, every man began to run headfirst into Confederate fire. Exhausted and overworked, it took every ounce of the Union troops' strength to keep fighting. Looking back, Chamberlain explains his decision to charge, quote, My ammunition was exhausted. My men were firing their last shot and getting ready to club their muskets. It was imperative to strike before we were struck by this overwhelming force in a hand-to-hand -hand fight which we could not probably have withstood or survived. At that crisis, I ordered the bayonet. The word was enough. It ran like fire along the line from man to man. 
and rose into a shout, with which they sprang forward upon the enemy, now not 30 yards away. End quote. Despite the bayonet charge of the 20th Maine, the Confederates continued their attempt to press forward. Their efforts were finally stopped after another surprise attack, but this time by Captain Morrill's Company B. His troops hid behind a stone wall and fired at the Confederate soldiers. Oates recalls his experience during the attack. Quote, With the withering and deadly fire pouring in upon us from every direction, it seemed that the entire command was doomed to destruction. While one man was shot in the face, his right hand or left hand comrade was shot in the side or back. Some were struck simultaneously with two or three balls from different directions. End quote. The Company B's assistance in shooting at the Confederate soldiers caused panic among the enemy, eventually leading to their retreat. With the arrival of Company B, Oates knew it was time to turn back. Quote, Finally, I discovered that the enemy had flanked me on the right and two regiments were moving rapidly upon my rear and not 200 yards distant. When to save my regiment from capture or destruction, I ordered a retreat. End quote. By the end of the battle, the 20th Maine had lost 38 men and had 93 wounded. Looking back on the battle, Chamberlain recounts, quote, All around, strange, mingled roar. Shouts of defiance, rally, and desperation. And underneath, murmured entreaty and stifled moans, gasping prayers, snatches of Sabbath song, whispers of loved names, everywhere men torn and broken, staggering, creeping, quivering on the earth, and dead faces with strangely fixed eyes staring stark into the sky. End quote. In a similar account, Oates declared, quote, The dead literally covered the ground. The blood stood in puddles on the rocks. The ground was soaked with the blood of as brave men as ever fell on the red field of battle. End quote. After the Confederates had retreated, Chamberlain moved the 20th Maine up Big Round Top in order to continue holding the line. The battle at Little Round Top on July 2, 1863, was a success for the 20th Maine. Although Chamberlain is given the majority of the credit for the victory at Little Round Top that day, he could not have done it without men like Andrew Tozer, who despite heavy fire, stood his ground and fought for his country. Or Lieutenant Melcher, the man brave enough to start the bayonet charge all on his own. Or Captain Morrill, who made the decision to move the Company B behind the stone wall in order to cover the charging soldiers. Or Ellis Spear, who controlled the entire left wing during the charge. Without these selfless men, the 20th Maine would not have seen success on Little Round Top that day.